and uh, presentations that constitute a movement. It's very interesting that one can choreograph movement by frames. Early in the 20th century, or even late in the 19th century, a photographer named Edward Muybridge would do whole sequences of movement with strips of photographs that would follow infinitesimal variations. And the whole strip then would give the movement of a nude woman walking, a nude man walking. This quality began to inform artists of the 1920s into the idea of doing a comic strip, that one can have a sequence of these kinds of vignettes. And then animation came out of that. And the movement from Moybridge to Walt Disney is a generation of investigation into the way in which frames that are aligned in a mythological sequence give the impression, feeling, of live activity, of live motion. The ultimate comic books were comics that were shrunk from the Sunday pages to the size of comic books that began to come out in the mid-1930s and shrunk even further so that they were called big little books. And you would have a page of text and a little picture next to them. And you would read through the comic book in this way. And it was a bridge between the animation movement and the literary movement in the mind. Our lectures form a sequence of discrete frames which because of their alignment and their narrative dynamic constitute really a choreographical movement. There is such a thing then as a ballet of ideas. In the examples that we're using now, Frank Lloyd Wright and Henry Moore, architecture and sculpture, in the 20th century, this has become one of the dominant themes of conscious intelligence. The Renaissance used a static perspective quality to visual art that was overcome by the three-dimensional qualities that painting was able to engender. But very often sculpture imitated the painting aesthetic norm and was reduced to a kind of a flat surface. One can count the great Renaissance sculptures on one hand. The great Renaissance painters, one needs many hands and many feet and toes of all your friends. If one looks at Donatello, you get in the early Renaissance that the Renaissance artist was capable of seeing in a sculptural way. The Donatello David is such a lithe, animated figure reverberating in the space that one gets this sense that here is a secular Hermes who is standing with all of his uh, young masculine grandeur ready for any movement at any time. But it isn't until one gets to Michelangelo towards the end of the Italian Renaissance that you again find sculpture coming to the forefront in its own right. And then you find something like Michelangelo's sculpture trying heroically to break out of the shackles of a frozen, static quality of perspective. If one sees the Michelangelo David, it's not at all like Donatello's David. Donatello's David is like the lithe, young soccer player who is ready for any movement at any time. 
Whereas Michelangelo's David is a monumental figure who needs all the muscular strength to twitch. He has a monumentality because the resistances are so great by that time they can hardly move. And one finds in the development of European sculpture, between Michelangelo and Rodin, there are very few sculptors who are sculptural. They are painterly. They have a perspective which belongs to painting and not to sculpture. And that's why Rodin becomes such an enormous figure and why the greatest influence on Henry Moore is Rodin and Michelangelo, the bookends of this whole 500 year epic of trying to overcome the frozen frame of reference that does not align itself so that one has no capacity even for a Muybridge type movement, for a Walt Disney type animation. Whereas the Muybridge movement of a whole string of clips of, of photographs of frames of someone moving or the Walt Disney animation the various cells that are aligned and then given quickly so many per second so that it looks like movement neither the Moybridge nor the Disney alignments are ballet and one sees the film of a Nijinsky or the film of a Nureyev, or when Barishnikov was first out and was just like a lightning bolt on the stage. Can you imagine someone doing a triple pirouette? It's like a Donatello come to life. And yet, when one looks at the film, one takes the, or used to be able to take the film out of the can and hold it up to the light with the little sprockets, one could see that the beautiful choreographed movement of the old Nijinsky on this old film, or the Nureyev, or even the Barishnikov, the lightning bolt on the stage, was a Muybridge movement. Because what you saw was not the uh, ballet, you saw a film of the ballet. And so we are often in the 20th century bereft of the magic of true movement. We don't get it. We don't experience it, except rarely. And not only to observe it in others, but to exuberantly do it ourselves. Have you ever dared a double pirouette in midair to music? It is this kind of primordial experience that used to be the springboard of consciousness for Paleolithic man. Paleolithic men and women 30,000 years ago discovered art because there was a quality of lightning-like dynamic feeling tone that came to them that kinesthetically confirmed to them that they were lighter than air, that they could jump into midair, that they could pirouette and twirl. And in this movement, in this exuberance, the human body became capable of a kind of flight, of a kind of suspension from the constraints of nature. One of the favorite Paleolithic illustrations I used to have up 30 years ago in my office in San Francisco for all the humanities students coming in to discuss their exams and their grading. There was a photograph of a Paleolithic artist who had portrayed himself running full blast with his spears in his hand. And I used to love it because I can remember when I was about 12 years old, running in the shallows of a bay of Lake Huron, chasing carp who had come to breed in the low waters, water only about two feet deep, and the carp big, 60, 70 pounds, so that in two feet of water, 
when you would chase them with tennis shoes and a towel-like cape and just naked with a spear and chase them for a couple miles across the shallow waters, chasing their furrows, that one had the sense that in the surface of Lake Huron was reflected the clear summer sky. And that at full speed, you can only run about four or five miles an hour in water like that. But there was the sense of being suspended in sky. And that Paleolithic sense reawakened. And there it was in that painting from that cave from like 25,000 years ago. I used to put it up in my office so as to bring the students out of the static arrangement with which they were shackling themselves. But they were students and I was somehow a teacher and this was a subject and these were exams and that that was what was going on. And I wanted to convey, no, there's a choreography, there's a dance, there's a ballet, that's going on together. And of course, 30 years later, I give no exams. We don't care about that. We don't discuss subjects and points in the subjects and dates and all of this. It's extraneous. There's you and I in this choreography where the language narrative is encouraging us to let go of the stodginess of things, to springboard us again into something which has access to magic. Because if you begin on the mythic level, you can reach all the way through the mind into the magic realm and touch on the other side of the magical ocean, touch the spiritual person. You can feel the objective resonance coming into some kind of formation, some kind of different kind of form, different kind of objectivity an objectivity which is differential rather than integral, a form which is open rather than integrally closed. Rather than being brought together, differential forms are objective because they continually open out further. The artist is a differential form. The artist continues to open out further and further the more that they are. So rather than being physiologically here as a thing, they're unconcerned with being a thing. They're unconcerned with being physiological. Only to the extent that one is able to go beyond that and spring into a different quality, to have wings. If one looks to experience a Henry Moore sculpture, one has to not only approach the thing, to see it with your eyes, and to approach it, to look at it, but one has to play with it. One has to walk around it and back and forth as one is going around it. Look over one's shoulder, and, uh, raise one's arm and look under that and see all these forms. And some of the larger Moore sculptures you walk into and you play with those forms. And it's not just Moore, but any sculpture can be given this kind of a quality. I remember early in 1970 in Calgary, Alberta, the city had so much oil money that they could buy works of art and they brought a circle of sculptural people kind of like a Zhao Kometi, only the sculptural people were about 20 feet high, and there were 15 or 16 of them in this circle in this park. And you would walk underneath them and through them, and it was like a stone hinge of Zhao Kometi sculptural people. And you could see the skyline of the burgeoning Calgary of that day right there behind them, and somehow this circle of dancing cinder block figure gave a proportion. It gave, in this particular sculpture, a pathos, but one also had an ethos of proportion. 
and you could go back into town. You could go back into the streets of rising skyscrapers and you could feel mobile. That mobility had been reestablished in a kinesthetic sense and that directly influenced your psychological, your conscious ability to size up possibilities, motion, potential, relationalities. So that consciousness became healthy to the extent that physiologically you felt mobile. Instead of being mummified by a false aesthetic, a conscious dynamic aesthetic freed you not to be who you are, but to experiment of who you might be. And that just as you gave yourself that freedom, you gave that to others, and more and more, and you began to see that the people that you addressed yourself to were capable of so many variations, they became interesting. All of them became interesting. None of them were throwaways, and you began to lose that cynicism, that curled up, soured, jailed quality that comes there from being fellow prisoners. It's like Henry Moore during the Second World War, sculpting the sleeping figures in the London subways, escaping the bombs. And these embalmed, bound bodies arranged in miles of tunnels underneath the city of London, sleeping in somnambulant in their terror of the bombings, became for Moore a transformative era. Emphasizing for him, because during the Second World War in the London of that time, one couldn't get sculptural materials very much. You could get some elm wood, but you couldn't get travertine marble from Italy. You couldn't get various foundries to do large bronzes, and so he was limited. And he was employed to do these sketchings for the war effort. But out of these sketches came whole new respect in Moore that his sculptures did not belong in studios or in museums, but that they belonged in nature. And the conviction from 1946 on for Moore, one of the primal dynamic driving forces for his sculpture was that they should belong in nature. So they should be at home in places that we consider the province of natural forms. And like a hero, because from the time of Beethoven on, the artist has had to stand as the only viable hero in the modern world. It's not the caped figure who's susceptible only to Krypton, who's the Superman, but it's the artist who stands toe to toe with the despair of misproportion of machines and empires that are so monolithic and enormous that they shrink the individual to a bug. We have no chance at all to be anything but an embalmed display of an object for those who run these huge enterprises. And for Moore or for Frank Lloyd Wright, it was the artist who stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with this massive despair and who dispelled it. We don't need to strengthen ourselves to Conan musculature to withstand this, but we can dispel the illusion that it was real in the first place. It had no reality. And rather than going to the gyms to develop muscles so that we can fight it, the artist shows us that we can dispel the delusion. We don't need all those muscles like a Michelangelo David, that would make us monolithically more static than ever. When we can acquire the Donatello gracefulness, and we can literally pirouette ourselves into freedom. Now, an education that doesn't deliver this is not worth your time, much less your money. 
With a Frank Lloyd Wright building, like a Henry Moore sculpture, you have to engage your entire kinesthetic quality with it. And you have to bring your mind. You have to activate and sensitize your mind. Because in between the objectivity of the body and the objectivity of the differential form of the work of art and of the artist of the spiritual conscious person, in between those two objective forms is the mediating objective form of the mind. A symbol, an idea, are very objective. Why is there a mind-body problem? Because the mind is as objective as the body. And when they are isolated from a more resonant development, like the artist, like the person, like the conscious individual that you are, when you are extracted and isolated from that, cut off from that potential, from that relational possibility, from that whole dimensional quality of development, then the body and the mind, like two bickering children, fall to fighting each other. It's mind. No, it's mind. And the mind-body split, which is so characteristic of the psychology of Europeans that it was taken to be universal, becomes catastrophically surprised when one discovers that in other civilizations, in other kinds of men and women, there was no such thing as a subconscious, unconscious, no such thing as a mind-body split. Where, in the whole 5,000 years of Chinese Taoist development, is there a mind-body split? Not even one instance of it. We're in the development of some 20,000 years of the Indians of the Americas. Is there a mind-body split? In which tribe is there a mind-body split? In which ceremony of any of the tribes of the Americas over 20,000 years, does one find a single ceremony to bridge and overcome a mind-body split? One could go into a George C. Scott monologue on this. <laughs> <laughs> There's an insightful freedom that art not only promises and not only guarantees, but delivers. A work of art, when it is engaged completely by you, sensitized and, and alive completely, plays with you to the extent that it helps you to free, to tune yourself to the resonant, infinite possibilities of a differential form. It allows you the choreography of a real movement and not simply to the appreciation, to use the British pronunciation, to the appreciation of a presented or represented motion. A represented motion, whether it's in a film strip or in a comic strip, or the earliest version of it was in the way in which Paleolithic caves had images that were placed in strategic junctures along the movement through those caves. And that strategic juncture of pictures, of images placed in such a way came down to us, down to the film strip, down to the comic strip, all the way through the murals in the cathedrals, all the way through the way in which images in the pyramids are arranged with text to give you a journey from the entrance to the sarcophagus. From a beginning to an end. With an extent along the way which is an alignment of images that are meant to inculcate to you the represented sense of movement. when the deep wisdom was not to pay attention to the represented movement, but to do 
the real movement yourself. And the real movement yourself was not to amble along following the pictures slavishly so that you, by the guidebooks, got to the final and were able to say, oh, they did this. But for you to choreograph your own movement so that when you get there, it is not a place, a static destination that you got to, a period to your movement, but it's a springboard for your own infinity. That you yourself emerge victorious. What's this beautiful billboard ad that the new Porsche has? It has a Porsche coming off a freeway. It says, emerge from the freeway victorious. Yes. Rack and pinion ideas. <laughs> disc brakes just temporarily to keep you from crunching, but an accelerator pedal that'll springboard you off again. What did Sterling Moss used to say? The race driver drives by the seat of his pants and not by his eyes. You get a sense of the movement of the concourse and you push it to the concourse, not by what you see. Let the other guy look out. You're out for, uh, for victory. Art is this kind of a concourse, movement, which you yourself do. To go to a museum to view works of art which belong to those institutions is the wrong way in which to address this. It sounds like 60s radicalism, but they're holding hostage free experiences that are misled by ignorant possessors. It is up to you in your aesthetic movement to free those works. You don't have to steal them from the space. That would be making a reductive mistake. You don't have to take the Rembrandt from the wall and take it out. But when you see Rembrandt in this kind of existentially dynamic aesthetic, it frees that painting. I remember an experience of about 25 years ago, the first time I tried to photograph the Gamble House in Pasadena. And I couldn't quite get the shots right, roll after roll of film. I couldn't get the architectural presentation of the Gamble House. The green and green uh, dynamic was so incredible to me. And finally, I just I gave up. I stuffed the camera and the film and everything into the knapsack, and I left the building. And as I left the building, I realized that my feet were, felt like they were scuffing clouds. <laughs> and then, like a flash, I saw that the symbolic motif that was the archetypal symbol that held the whole architecture of the Gamble House together was the Japanese cloud motif, the line that has a little bit of the bubble circle in the middle so that your movement has this kind of choreographed graceful leap, this kind of a ballet pirouetting in the midst of your movement. On that, the Green and Green brothers had done such a beautiful job that the architecture itself impinges physiologically upon you so that if you are alert, you will be scuffing clouds coming out of the building you will feel that air-cushioned leap of the aesthetic freedom that this is what they had done. And one begins to realize that great art is very great. I mean, Tony the Tiger, great. <laughs> I mean, stuff that's frosted flaked good. It's like when you were a child and you felt that there was a lot of magic in the world. Well, there's a lot of magic in the world. And the greatest magicians of all are the great artists. They pull off the biggest heist in the universe. They pull off differential objectivity in the midst of a reductiveness that seems almost characteristic of inorganic matter. 
the stupidity of closed off people is very much like an inorganic universe. Everything clogs to the ultimate stable sediment that you can count on. You can't run very far holding things that you can count on. Whereas if you jettison them all, you can run full blast as far as you can go. It's this kind of quality. Towards the end of Henry Moore's long career, he had spent some 60 years or more, almost 70 years, making sculpture. I would like to show you one comparison of two figures that are very similar. Both of them are girls, sculptures of girls. One done in 1930 and one done in 1980. This is the quality of movement that I've been trying to uh, document for you and convey to you. And of course, I've lost the place. But the first one is this sculpture, this girl, done in 1930. Notice the arms making an infinity sign. Notice the beautiful balance here. This is entitled a girl with clasped hands, and it's the cinching of the hands together like this that ostensibly would be a closed circuit. If you hold your hands like that, that's a closed circuit. It's a completed finale. This is the mudra of beseeching. Please. But hands like this, since like this, allow the flow of movement from one arm to another, and it creates this kind of circularity, this kind of movement. And when the pair of breasts, the pair of arms, the pair of clasped hands are positioned in this way, one gets the sense that for Moore, the body of the woman is this infinity movement. It's a choreography of total openness that somehow unites and brings the mystery of nature all the way through the objectivity of the body, the objectivity of the mind, into the objectivity of the differential person. And that the mystery of nature somehow, like some secret message, has come all the way through there and is able to play in the universe. Fifty years later, if I can find it in here, here it is. Girl with Crossed Arms, 1980. A super, a hypersonic, this is a Mach 6 sculpture, like the one done 50 years ago. 50 years before. The movement has so streamlined the arms and the hands and the body that it is all but a swirl, like a spiraling, like a spiraling, swirling that penetrates into the material itself, into the travertine marble itself. And when one listens to filmed interviews with Moore or reads some of the words of Henry Moore or looks at his sculpture artistically with a differential aesthetic, you see that one of the charms of travertine marble for him is that its surface has this pitted quality. Not pitted, but it has a density that allows for characteristic spaces minutely to pepper the entire form so that travertine marble is not exactly all there in the material, but it's exactly all there in the material and spaces together. Stuff and space together is the texture of travertine marble. And when handled in this way, with this kind of swirling penetration into the form itself, one of the old secrets of Paleolithic civilization comes to life. 
The secret is that when man for real does a movement, nature reciprocates. If you move these fingers for real, the musculature of these fingers will increase <laughs> minutely once. But any movement of the body in a repetitious way will increase the musculature so it's easier and easier to do that movement. And it doesn't have to just be repetitious, but it can be a choreographed movement of freedom and openness. I always laugh at the high school gym teachers that pretend to be Taoist in our time and before. They try to teach Tai Chi as 108 movements or Yang style or all these limitations. 2,300 years ago, Chuang Tzu ridiculed these people who seek to make Taoist bodies out of this limited static imagery of so many movements imitating animals in this reductive ritual way. Whereas the free play of that kind of open choreography acclimates the body to infinite openness. Not only do certain muscles develop, but the entirety of the body as a sliver of lightning develops in wholeness. No one has better muscular training than the modern athletes of big name sports. The basketball players, the football players, the baseball players, who make millions or tens of millions of dollars. They have the best training you can have. But their training is all piecemeal. It's Moybridge style, it's animation style. They have all sets of muscles that are developed a few at a time, but the entirety of the body doesn't develop, and so they're always on the injury list. What modern baseball pitcher could pitch 500 complete games like Cy Young. Is there anyone who, pe who pitches 300 complete games like Warren Spahn within living memory? When you look at somebody like a Pete Rose who had 4,000 hits, he played like Sandlot wholeness. He was always just Pete Rose. He didn't go in for the muscular buildup of this set of little muscles and then this set of little muscles, he just played ball. And so he was able to play ball. It's like that in terms of conscious person. If you try to mechanically develop over this weekend, this little piece, over that weekend, this little piece, you go down for a little shamanic journey in the Rio Negro no, we need to balance that. We've got to go to the Bay of Bengal. We've got to go up the Brahmaputra River. We've got, to, we've got to do an esoteric kind of hatha rowing during the monsoon rains under full moon. Because then we've got it. Whereas your spiritual person is being starved to death because it's you who needs to be free. Not those muscles, not that choreography, not that mind. Let them struggle with the monsoon. Let them work out the heat and humidity of the Rio Negro. You have the infinite possibility of your actual person who's ready to be free at any time. And because nature reciprocates, the more that you are free, the more that Mother Nature notices that you are free and gives you the space within which to be free. And that's how it works. That's a yoga. Let's take a break. That we can play with just for a second. The statement was, a differential form shows its Tao or to put it into another language, a differential form always in its presentation has its zeros noticeable. So that the Tao, the zero, the interval, 
is a part of a differential form. That's why music is a differential form. The intervals are as important as the notes. If you don't get the interval pacing, it doesn't matter how clear those notes are. It's going to be inarticulate. I remember one time driving from Calgary, Alberta to Dallas, Texas, which is three days of the most boring travel outside of Mongolia. And the only cassettes I could find in the car were Pablo Casals doing the solo partitas of Bach and Ali Akbar Khan playing the Rag Marwa, the 40-minute raga. And so I got into this whole thing of alternating and just playing them, one after another, all day, all three days. And I had this invisible hum by the time I got to um, the outskirts of Dallas. North of there is a little town called Denton, Texas. And I got into this, this wind and rainstorm, and I was just humming through it. All the other guys were pulling off the road. I was just coursing, because I had the choreography of the reel. And there's no way I'm not going to get there. A differential form shows its down, shows its zeros. Not only integrates its interval with it, but discloses it in the very form. So that when it comes to like spring of 1997, Cambridge University Press, the latest books in physics and chemistry, Zeke Z-E-K-E, -E, spectroscopy, from the Technical University in Munich, the author. Since 1984, Zeke spectroscopy has matured into a high-resolution spectroscopy. Z-E-K-E -E is short for zero kinetic energy. Zero kinetic energy. Spectroscopy. For the study of Kantians, anions, and indirectly through these species, all neutrals, including very short-lived intermediates and chemical reactions. When you get down to the atomic and molecular level, chemical reactions have very short, brief phases where neutral particles help make the bridging. They're not there before, they're not there after. They're only there, we're talking split picoseconds. Well, zero kinetic energy spectroscopy can pick them up because it's not looking only at the notes, but it's taking in what's not there also. Taking in the zeros, the Tao. This is the Tao of physics. This is the Tao of physics. It's like 21st century intelligence is leaving behind as if it were walking out of a mud village the misconceptions of millennia. And it's like an invitation saying, you don't have to stay in the mud. We can come back and play in the mud anytime and enjoy it. But we have wings. That's a whole cosmos of wonder. Let's go and see. Let's find out. Let's imagine. And one of the lessons from our ancient primeval ancestors, men and women alike, is that nature loves to play with mysteries and she reciprocates. And the more that we exhibit freedom, the more that she makes more room for that freedom. She gets fascinated too. She gets intrigued that you're willing to play on larger levels and she says, you've outgrown the theater, let's have the whole amphitheater. Let's have the entire sphere. Well, one planet's not enough for them. Well, let's give them the whole cosmos. Let's let them really play. Because it's of interest. Because it's, it's there. So a differential form shows its tau, shows its zeros. In terms of Henry Moore sculpture, the form and the spaces together are resonant pair. 
I once gave a lecture to a women's study group at uh, UC Berkeley in the mid 60s. There were there was a demand for these kinds of things. Nobody had ever given these kinds of lectures. And I gave a lecture on the holes of Henry Moore and the eternal spaces of Virginia Woolf. And it was uh, to a class with my old friend J.J. Wilson, who did a book on great women artists through the ages and founded the Women's Studies Program at Sonoma State. And took this traveling tour of great women artists all over the world. People were surprised that there were artists like V.J. Lebrun that they'd never heard of and so forth, and that there were many great women artists. Make your picture a little lighter. It's too dark. Come back into. Yeah, let's make it interesting so people can see. Yeah, ah, that's it. Good. One needs to pay attention to the edges. One has to have a peripheral vision for these kinds of details. One doesn't have to be overbearing about it. But we do have the right to expect for a more interesting scale of our play, a more inviting and invitational and tasty and nourishing quality to the dimensions that we are willing to participate in. That is to say, it has to be interesting. In at least four or five different films, interviewers of Henry Moore ask him, in various ways and various levels of intelligence and aesthetic awareness, why do you make these forms? And his reply is always some variant of, because I'm interested in them. I've always been interested in them. When he was a young man working first into sculpture, and he was making his sculptural forms. In 1934, he discovered something. He discovered that he could make a sculpture out of several pieces. I have, it, I have an example from 1934 in one of these books, but it was a sculpture of a reclining figure abstracted into four forms. One of them was a sphere, one of them was kind of like an abstract head with a little gouge in it. One was the knees. One was the, the buttock hip area. But there were four separate pieces. And you could move these pieces around together. You could play with the arrangement. And that all of this constituted a gestalt being. This kind of gestalt being is like a superhuman form to someone on the tribal level, but it's everyday reality to someone who is, in their own person, a differential form. I can separate myself into several different uh, uh, areas and uh, watch the interplay between them quite easily. There's no difficulty at all. I would feel mummified to just think that my ego identity was the whole show. It would be embarrassingly and boringly stupid. And so too anyone that one meets. That the ego prefers identity above anything else is structurally necessary to that particular integral form. It has to follow those kinds of principles because it bases itself purely on ritual existential bodily materiality. The ego is challenged even by a culminating integral form like the mind. The mind already challenges the ego. The ego already is rather suspect of the powers of the mind. And the ego becomes downright nasty and mean and resentful when opposed to the spiritual person as a differential form. Because the differential person 
is not interested in maintaining an identity at all costs, or even at great cost, or sometimes even at nominal cost. A great deal of the development of the further reaches of yoga was all to let the identity of the ego slowly evaporate into the equanimity of the transcendental mind. To show the ego like some scared little animal that it certainly may have its security. You may have your food, you may have your place, you may have your little mat by the fire, by the hearth side, of course. But don't expect that that's the full range of what is real. And you can carry that security and that identity into a transformation where the rest of the spirit can be at home and find its place and still treasure that child, actually. The ego's like a child, like an adolescent child. One of Henry Moore's great themes is mother and child. And in all the early sculptures, it's usually some variant of that child as a baby. And there's always this kind of protective covering where the shoulders of the mother are accentuated as to be this kind of sheltering cavern and within that sheltering cavern, there would be the breasts emphasized and then one breast transformed into a baby. There would be one breast and one baby. Almost never do you see a Henry Moore sculpture where there are two babies. Or sometimes the sheltering shoulders will have a breast and a hole where the baby would be. It would be a penetration, be an acceptance, a full openness. She would be nursing an openness. She would be cradling an openness. Or in the variation that we showed earlier from 1931, where the girl, or 1930 rather it is, where the girl who has her arms folded has both breasts showing and the shoulders uh, holding them, but there is the space in between the arms where they're folded like this, the double opening. So that space and form interplays. And always in more is a balance which is not egotism. The ego always looks for compensation. The ego always wants eye for an eye. The ego keeps infinite track. The ego knows exactly what you owe on what account. It's a hell of an accountant. Or what somebody else owes. Decades later, so and so, they owe on this account. Plus interest. <laughs> We're not talking about usury. We're talking about good old fashioned, just basic profit. <laughs> it's to keep those ledgers whereas compensation doesn't occur to the differ differential form at all why? because the differential form the person understands the, that in the ecology of integration the reciprocity of nature is much more primordial than the identity of things the identity of things at its ultimate is plus and minus meeting, and therefore that's how something gets to be. That the physicality is there because the pluses and the minuses come together. The ledger is balanced. So many protons, so many electrons, positives and negatives, you got an atom of oxygen. But what's peculiar about nature is that nature does not mind at all that there are ions of elements. They're missing an electron or sometimes missing two electrons. So they're ionized. 
and nature permits ions of atoms and allows for different atoms then in terms of their ionic openness to come together so that sodium and chloride in their ionized forms come together and make NaCl, they make salt. And that molecule of salt is extremely stable in the universe, one of the most stable things there is in the universe. Outside of the proton, the atom of salt is very, very stable. And yet, it's easily soluble in H2O. Two hydrogens and one oxygen, because their ionization means. So that the whole development of molecular matter is all based upon the perfection of atoms, including ionized resonances as a part of its nature. The ego has to understand this. That it can have some days where it's ionized and it's completely natural. Yes, it's minus certain securities, minus certain stability. But that means there's an opportunity today for a new molecule of experience. Something unexpected. A taste that surprises one by its delicacy, by its nuance. One would like to explore that. And you need to know how to ionize yourself in that way for another day. Have that taste again. But not only that. Even beyond that is the fact that most atomic structures include neutral particles, like the neutron. The nucleus of the atom, if it has only protons, is rather an unstable thing, though the proton in itself is the most stable particle in the whole physical universe. The life expectancy of a proton is about 20 billion years. And even then, it finally decays. The Buddha said, all existent things are temporary. And they are, just that some are more temporary than others. But the neutron, or the zero kinetic energy spectroscopy of any chemical reaction showing its little neutral particles, what does it say here? It says, short, neutral, short-lived intermediates. that they are also detectable. They're a part of the structure. They're a part of the way in which structures are not only capable of stability, but that stability is reciprocally met with transformability. The way in which an atom of sodium is by itself and an atom of sodium with an atom of chlorine are together are radically different. Sodium as an element, extremely volatile, whereas with chlorine, extremely stable. Salt and sodium. Sodium is the same family as potassium. Potassium, if you expose it to oxygen, bursts into flame. All by itself, combustible. It's this quality of reality that our education is sensitizing us to and especially here in art, we're sensitizing ourselves because we're realizing that differential forms like works of art, like the artist, like the spiritual conscious person, are characteristic of this whole diagonal and diameter of truth that informs reality. It makes molecules work. It makes music work. It makes us capable of working in an actuality which is truthful. One can investigate it to any extent that you wish, to any depth, to any scope, with any specificity. And once you have the sensitivity and intellectual awareness, the acuity of relationality awakened, you can confirm to yourself. The old saying was, work out your own salvation with diligence. You can set up whatever experiments you want. Gandhi entitled his autobiography, My Experiments with Truth. A scientist of the person. 
But you can find out to any degree that you need to. You can play for real in any field that one wishes to go to and confirm to yourself on any criteria or arrangement of criteria that you wish. And you can come again and again, not simply to a Moy Bridge alignment of a representation of truth, but you can live it in the choreography of your actual life movement. So that in the Chinese Tao, the very first quality in art was spirit resonance life movement. When the Tang Dynasty was first getting energized and China had this tremendous energy of uh, conscious awareness of the ability to dissimulatingly make life sing. The greatest aesthetician of that day wrote a simple essay on art and the criteria for art, the aesthetics, the Taoist aesthetics, in the very first line were four Chinese words that translate as spirit, resonance, life, movement. <laughs> that a work of art has the spirit, resonance, life, movement that one can come into reciprocity with. One can come into play with it, into interface. And when you do, you realize that that work of art has annealed itself chemically to you. That you and that work of art have made a new molecule of experience that was never there in nature before and now is there. And that the difference between nature and where you are now is the difference between an integral spectrum that comes to rest at the center of the mind and the farther reaches of the resonance of that integral center that comes to rest at the center of the mind, the resonance of the harmonics that play forever, the fields of the Lord are very wide indeed. And that there are the supernatural, the otherworldly, the beyond, the conscious infinities of the cosmos new molecules, new atomic structures, new materials. One discovers in the play that one can make whole new materials out of this. There are 21st century materials being made now that are laminal flows. That are materials that uh, do 5,000 things at once. <laughs> that no natural material could ever have done. And they're being made now, used now, coming out now. This quality, when it goes into an architectural experience, like a Frank Lloyd Wright building, has the ability to have the space of the place ionized so as to reciprocate with your openness so that when you come into the building, the building plays with you. Like the green and green house where the cloud motif allows you to kinesthetically feel the clouds. A Frank Lloyd Wright place, and we'll try and go and visit a couple of them here in Los Angeles. We can go see the Hollyhock house, the Ennis house, the Freeman house. Go and see a Frank Lloyd Wright architectural structure and play in it. And to the extent that you do, for instance, the Hollyhock House, when you're coming into the what is the front door of the Hollyhock House, there is this kind of a limited cavern-like feeling. The front door is almost like this Mayan stone plug at the end of a passageway that becomes more and more a tunnel until it's finally just there. But as you go into it, kinesthetically, the walls, the ceiling, the floor have an incised sculptural code that acclimates your kinetic sense to the proportions that are going to be used throughout the entire house. Has an iconography of the theme of the flower, the hollyhock, 
which has many blossoms on a single stalk. Not just a flower at the end of a stalk, but that the stalk itself is a cosmos of flowering. That's a whole constellation of vertical blossoming. And that the hollyhock house is a place, a space of living where vertical blossoming is possible. And as soon as one enters into the front door, does the little twist with the door latch that would have sealed it, the house opens and opens and opens and opens. And at the very center of that house, at the place in which the whole weight, if one were to make a block out of the whole hollyhock house concentration, the center of gravity where that house would pivot is where the great fireplace is. And that great fireplace has the focus of all four elements. Earth, air, fire, and water come together. But a fifth element, a quintessential element of consciousness, also comes into play and is worked into the music of the structure. So that when one calibrates and sensitizes oneself by using the entrance passageway as a beginning tuning and then uses the hearth of Hollyhock House as the compositional scroll, the way in which you're going to now play this music, then you take yourself with that capacity and walk through the place and it sings with you. And the entire house becomes this spontaneous riff of indefinite duration of the jazz of the way in which you want to play. You can go on many days and play a different tune every day. I've gone for over 30 years and never tired of it. It's a quality of architecture that allows for a reciprocity rather than a compensation. The work of art is not insistent about compensation at all. Nor should we be. But like a conscious, supernatural mystery responds to us as we play. In Henry Moore, in his sculpture, one of the most primal forms for him was the reclining figure. Not only because of its horizontal stability, like a Frank Lloyd Wright prairie house with its horizontals, its stability. But that the reclining figure allows for a transformation. The reclining figure occupies a geographical focus. It's a locus and a focus. The loci et foci of the old Stoic memory system that you can find still in Cicero. That one remembers because there's a cross hatching, there's an egg crating of locus and focus. That one is able to use that as a stylization of the way in which one remembers experience. But that beginning transforms, is capable of a transformation. The kind of transformation that happens when a musician looks at a score on a flat page on his music stand about when he takes up his instrument and he plays that score, that music lifts off the page and into a kinetic possibility of infinite space. So too, the music has to lift off the page. One has to take not the old loci et foci basis of memory as the be it all and end all, but only as the barest beginning out of which a transformation happens. So that the sculpture of Henry Moore, which is the loci et foci of the geography of wherever that sculpture is, that place, the sculpture itself transforms the entire space, transforms the geography, lifts it off the flat plane of habituated location, of habituated focus, transforms 
because the sculpture itself transforms, becomes a prism out of which the geography lifts off the plane into a sphere. And instead of having the old geometry of the plane surface, one has the trigonometry of the sphere. But the sculpture also participates in the space around it. And that that space extends not only above into the air, the resonance of the form into the air around it, but also underneath. It penetrates into the plane surface of the earth so that very often when Moore in the 1950s was taking on the enormity of urban man-made skyscrapers, the Lincoln Center in New York, the great center in downtown Toronto, the UNESCO building in Paris, he would set these large reclining sculptures in water. So that the pool of water would reflect and increase and show the sphericality of the range of that sculpture. Not just that its reflection was a compensation, but it was a reciprocity of the trigonometry of transformation that had happened. About the time that this demonstration of Moore's genius was beginning to penetrate into certain sensitivities and mentalities. There's a man in England, his name is uh, Michael Denz. Been studying Paleolithic art for a long time. Had been wondering about the mysteries of some of the old monuments, the old megalithic monuments in Britain. And one of the most difficult of all of the monuments there's a hill called Silbury Hill that's not far from Avebury, not too far from Stonehenge. But what Silbury Hill was for, hardly anyone understood at all. Until sensitized by Henry Moore's sculptures in pools, he was on top of Silbury Hill one time, a torrential rainstorm puzzling over. And there, the accrual of the water rushing off Silbury Hill collected around the base of it and formed this pool. And in this pool, the clouds cleared a little bit and the light rays, he could see that the entirety of Silbury Hill floated in the sky in the reflection of that water. Then he realized that from any angle, looking at Silbury Hill, in the horizon of perspective of geography and landscape, Silbury Hill was always seen to resemble a breast. And then he realized this was the breast of the sky goddess they were standing on. He was the nipple. And he just he broke down. He wrote a book about it. To realize that thousands of years ago, men and women had already been sophisticated enough not only to understand this, but to put the thousands and tens of thousands of man hours that are required to go into making such a monument and to put it right there at the entrance to this great enclave of Avebury and Stonehenge and uh, the whole complex of the Salisbury Plain as to show that we understand the magic of consciousness in the trigonometry of a cosmos. We have every right to have the reciprocity of nature on that scale because we're not just representations decaled to the surface of life, but we're a living spirits who inhabit the entire dimensions of what is real. And we're responded to in that way, in that kind, in that openness. <laughs>